Hello and welcome to the second video series of the Basics of Audio Technology training series. Again, if you haven't watched the introductory video, please stop and go watch that now. But we're going to continue. This video is going to cover chapter two, transducers. So what is a transducer? A transducer is anything, a system or device that converts one form of energy to another. So my body is a transducer. I have all this energy within me and I'm converting it into acoustic energy when I speak. Um, but we're going to be specifically talking about microphones and speakers. Microphones take acoustic sound pressure waves or energy and convert that into electricity and speakers do the opposite. Now it's very important to know how specifically these transducers, microphones and speakers work, their different designs, the pros and cons, because not all speakers, not all microphones are created equally and you're not going to use the same microphone for every single scenario. There's different mics for different purposes and we're going to be talking about that. So the first microphone that we're going to be talking about is the dynamic microphone. If you go to page 17, figure 9, you can see all about dynamic microphones and the charts there with the disadvantages and advantages. So first we're going to start out with how this works. This works using Faraday's law. So I'm going to stop here and go to an example showing Faraday's law. In this example I'm going to be showing how a dynamic microphone works via electromagnetic induction. So Faraday's law simply states that when you change the strength or flux of a magnetic field around a conductive coil of wire, you will produce a voltage change. So here I have a magnet, and as you can see, when I change the magnetic field around this conductive coil of wire, we have a voltage change. Now typically in a microphone, you would have the coil of wire connected to a diaphragm that's surrounding a magnet. So when air pressure waves hit the diaphragm, the coil moves around the magnet. And as you can see, that changes voltage. But for demonstration purposes, it's easier to see this way. Now, the rate at which I move the magnet determines the rate at which the voltage changes. And the energy, the amount of force that I do, changes the amplitude of the voltage as well. So in a microphone, we have a one-to-one -one direct correlation of sound pressure waves, frequency and amplitude translated into voltage. And we will be talking about that later in analog sound. Now I'm gonna demonstrate with a slightly stronger magnet here. When I move in one direction, the voltage changes in that direction. When I move in the other direction, it changes in that direction as well. And the speed at which I do it also correlates. And so if I move this slowly, you can see there's very little change in amplitude. Now if I do it quickly, lots of energy, there's a big spike. So again, we have a one-to-one -one direct correlation of sound pressure waves translated into electrical audio. And that is how a dynamic microphone works. Okay, so hopefully that video gives you a really good idea of how electromagnetic induction works. And that's how our first microphone works, the dynamic microphone. On page 17, figure nine, you can see a diagram of a dynamic microphone. We have a magnet here with a coil of wire around it, and that coil of wire is attached to a diaphragm. When sound waves hit the diaphragm, it causes the coil of wire to move, which we now know will induce a voltage. Um, so this is a very simple design. Because it is simple means it can be inexpensive, and it's typically durable and moisture resistant, which also means it can have a long life. But there are disadvantages to a dynamic microphone, the first of which is a poor transient response. And when I mean transient response, I mean sounds that come and go very quickly. Transient sounds like T's and S's, something that just hit and leave. Um, and that's because they typically don't carry a lot of energy with it. And you need a lot of energy for a dynamic microphone because you have a coil of wire and it has mass to it and that's connected to the diaphragm so it's going to require a certain amount of energy to move that diaphragm in order for that sound to be picked up 
which also means it has a limited frequency response because typically higher frequencies have less energy and they're not going to be able to move that diaphragm, which also means that it's going to have a nonlinear frequency response. So from low to high, those frequencies are not going to be picked up at the same volume. And the last disadvantage of a dynamic microphone is that it usually requires a larger size because you're working with a magnet and a coil of wire and a diaphragm. You can only but get that so small before it stops working. So typically larger microphones are dynamic microphones. Now the next microphone we're going to be talking about is not actually a microphone in the normal sense. It's an electromagnetic guitar pickup which is still a microphone in a sense that it's a transducer. It converts one form of energy to another. Now, this works by using one center iron mag magnetic pole with a coil of wire around it, and when the string vibrates, it's going to disrupt the magnetic field, which we now know will create a voltage. And there is another design for pickups in which you can have one large magnet with one large coil around it, and that's going to pick up all six strings. Now, a fun fact about electromagnetic pickups on a guitar, where you place them also depends on what type of tone you will pick up from that guitar. When you place them towards the center, you're going to pick up more of the fundamental frequency and less of the higher harmonics as they go up, which means you're going to have a fuller, lower, thicker sound to the guitar. When you put the pickup towards the outside, towards the bridge, you're going to pick up less of the fundamental frequency and more of the higher harmonics. So you're going to have a higher, tinnier, less full sound. And that's the advantage of a switchable pickup pattern on a guitar. You can choose the tone that you want based on where it sits. Now, the next microphone that we're going to be talking about, well, actually, before I move on, I'm going to talk about one more thing. We know because of phase, you can have constructive and destructive interference. Now, when it comes to a guitar, uh, we're dealing with electronics, and essentially what you're creating here in this design is just a really good magnet. Um, so you can be picking up um, electromagnetic interference from fluorescent lights and other things. You can get that 60 hertz hum. So what they've designed is called humbucker pickups, which is simply a pickup of this any similar design, but half of the coil is going in one direction and the other half of the coil is going in the other so that it sends out a duplicated signal out of phase and any um, introduced interference is going to get canceled out through that phase cancellation when both of them are flipped and then summed together because if it wasn't flipped you put them together it's going to equal 100 percent destructive interference but they flip the phase add it together, and that interference is going to be canceled out. And so that is a humbucker pickup. Um, we will also talk about that when we talk about balance signal methods. It's almost the exact same thing in concept. But moving on to the next microphone, we're going to be talking about condenser microphones. Now, condenser microphones are, in reality, just capacitor microphones. And the reason they're called condenser microphones is because a long time ago, capacitors were referred to as condensers. But when it comes to microphones, for some reason, we stuck with condenser. Now, a capacitor is an electrical element used to store, electro, store energy electrostatically, which is just a long way to say it, that you have two plates and in between them, they hold a static charge. Now, as you can see, again, the two plates holding a static charge, one plate will be attached to the diaphragm, and when that diaphragm moves, those plates are gonna go farther or closer together, and that's going to change the static charge within the two plates. Now, when we think about an electromagnetic induction dynamic microphone, that means the voltage is gonna go from positive to negative. But in a capacitor, you have a static positive charge, and it's only going to get more or go down, but never reach negative. And so we have to add circuitry to translate that for us, translate the difference so that we can understand it, which means that it's going to require internal circuitry. And that's where some of the disadvantages of a capacitor or condenser microphone come in. It's going to be complex because it requires circuitry, which also means it can be expensive which also means it can be a little more fragile. Um, and another disadvantage it means it will be because of the circuitry, it requires phantom power. Now, phantom power is just 48 volts 
of electricity riding on the signal path, meaning going down the microphone path. And that's going to be powering this internal circuitry and sometimes even powering the static charge. Now, in an electret condenser microphone that you'll see on the next couple pages, um, an electret capacitor condenser microphone holds a static charge permanently and does not require phantom power. But most condenser microphones will require phantom power because they are not electret condensers. Uh, lastly, um, it can also be affected by environmental conditions. It can be more prone to damage due to moisture, whereas dynamic micro microphones are not. So if you're going to be outside and there's a chance of rain, maybe bringing your older, less expensive dynamic microphones might be the best choice, as opposed to your ex more expensive, better capacitor condenser microphones. Now, the advantages of this are because it only requires two very small thin pieces of metal holding a charge, it can be very small. And because it can be very small, you can have a good transient response, which means also you can have a high sensitivity, which also means you can have a very linear frequency response. And that frequency response can be extended. You can have a very large frequency response, meaning you can pick up very high frequencies because it does not take a lot of energy to move that diaphragm. And then lastly, again, it can be very small. You can see a lot of those headset microphones or lapel microphones. Those are all capacitor condenser microphones. They can be very, very small. So those are the advantages and disadvantages of a capacitor microphone. Now, again, um, electric condenser microphones hold a permanent charge. Their advantage is they do not require phantom power, um, and they can also be less expensive. But their disadvantage is sometimes they re can require batteries, but then also their uh, response characteristics can change over time. As that permanent charge, not being so permanent after all, changes, um, it can change the frequency response with it. This next microphone that I'm talking about is a ribbon microphone. Now, you may not actually ever see a ribbon microphone in your lifetime because one of the main dis disadvantages is that they are expensive and fragile. A ribbon microphone works via electromagnetic induction, but in a very different way from a dynamic microphone. As you can see in the diagram here, there is no coil of wire anywhere. Instead of a coil of wire, you have a corrugated, very thin piece of metal ribbon that's suspended in a magnetic field. And when that ribbon moves, it will induce a voltage. Now, this thin piece of ribbon is very fragile. Lots of ribbon microphones are not rated for high sound pressure level environments. So sometimes if you blow into them, you can break them. If you put them in front of a, an electric guitar amp, you can break it. So it's very important to read the manual when coming across a ribbon microphone to see what its sound pressure level rating is at so that you don't break it. Another thing that makes these um, very fragile and easily broken is think of a light bulb. You have uh, one very thin piece of filament in between two conductors and you pipe voltage through that. So the same thing with a ribbon microphone. You have a very thin piece of filament being in a ribbon. If you turn on phantom power to a ribbon microphone, um, it's essentially like just blowing out a light bulb. You're gonna break the ribbon. But there are some ribbon micro microphones with fail safes that do stop the phantom power, but not all of them do. So if you do come across a ribbon microphone, just remember two things. They're expensive and they're fragile. So handle with care and do not use phantom power. But other than that, there are a lot of advantages to using a ribbon microphone. They have an exceptional transient response, typically way better than some condenser microphones. They have a very high sensitivity and they have a very good frequency response. So they can be a lot better than condenser microphones in some applications. Um, the other disadvantage and last disadvantage to a ribbon microphone is based on its design. Um, it can only be a bi-directional or figure eight microphone, which we will talk about a little more in just a little bit. Now, moving on to the last microphone design, we have a crystal or piezoelectric microphone. When it comes to a traditional vocal microphone or a microphone that you would place in front of an instrument, we really don't see that anymore when it comes to crystal microphones. Um, we really only see crystal microphones being used as a piezo pickup for a guitar, acoustic guitar, 
or as a contact microphone, but I don't have a contact microphone in the diagram here. Now, crystal microphones work via piezoelectricity, which is essentially using certain types of crystals that produce an electric charge when mechanical stress is applied to it. When it's squeezed or bent or twisted, a voltage will be produced from that crystal. So here in the old microphone design that we really don't see anymore, you have a diaphragm that's connected to a crystal with conductive foil on either side. And when the diaphragm moves, the crystal has mechanical stress applied to it and a voltage is induced. Typically what we see is in a guitar, here's the string, the saddle and the bridge, the piezo pickup is gonna run all the way the length of the saddle right under the saddle so that when the string vibrates, it sends that vibration down and is being, being picked up by the piezo pickup and then a voltage is induced to send out. Now, the last one is a contact microphone, which is simply just a thin piece of piezoelectric crystal, usually coated with a rubber coating or some sort of pad, and one side can be sticky, and you just stick it onto certain instruments, and when those instruments vibrate, it's gonna vibrate the crystal and produce a voltage. The disadvantage to those and the piezoelectric pickup is that it's not gonna pick up any acoustic sound in the air. It only picks up physical sound waves. So depending on where you place a crystal microphone on an instrument, dictates the tone that you're gonna pick up from that instrument. Just like when you placed a pickup, electromagnetic pickup on a guitar neck or bridge, picked up a different tone, based on where you put a crystal microphone also dictates the tone because vibrating bodies, remember, they don't all vibrate at the fundamental. There's many different modes of vibrations, and those modes of vibrations change depending on where it is on the body of the instrument. Um, so that is the main disadvantage for a crystal microphone. It does not pick up acoustic sound, but that can also be an advantage. For instance, you can use a contact microphone on cymbals. When you use a contact microphone on cymbals rather than an overhead microphone, when you hit a snare drum and that snare drum is picked up by its own microphone, the overhead microphone can also pick up the snare drum. But if you use a contact microphone, that contact microphone, remember, does not pick up acoustical sound waves. It only picks up physical sound waves. So it's only going to pick up sound from the cymbal. So again, it's a disadvantage and advantage depending on what scenario you are in. And those are the different designs of microphones. Again, it's dynamic, uh, electromagnetic pickups, condenser, ribbon microphone, and a piezoelectric or crystal microphone and pickup. Next, we're going to be talking about polar response patterns of microphones. Now, within the different broad designs of microphones, whether dynamic or condenser, you can also design microphones for very specific purposes or with different characteristics. And the most common characteristic that everybody looks for is the polar response pattern. If you look on page 24, the diagram here, we have the, diff the five most common polar response patterns of microphones. Now, these are two-dimensional representations of a three-dimensional concept. So take, for instance, the omnidirectional microphone. It picks up sound in all directions. So when you look at an omnidirectional microphone like I have here, it doesn't pick up sound only from the front here in a tubular fashion. Imagine a sphere being around this. It picks up in all directions. It picks up from the front and the back and all the sides and everywhere in between. The same goes for the other ones. Just imagine these being rotated in a three-dimensional uh, form so that a cardioid pattern picks up like this, but then rotated in all directions so that it does not pick up from the rear very well at all. And from the sides, it picks up even less. From the front, it picks up the most. Now, the way these are designed changes from manufacturer to manufacturer, but menu, but universally, the concept is the same. It uses phasing to our advantage. So as we know, when two um, frequencies are out of phase entirely, we have destructive interference. And so we use that in the design to get directionality for microphones. This is an omnidirectional microphone. And if you can look all around here, there are no holes of any kind or no ports in the side of this microphone, which means that sound only enters from the front and hits the diaphragm from the front only. 
which means, and that's why it's able to collect sound on all sides. Now, other microphones, such as this vocal microphone, which has a windscreen on it, or a grill, once you take it off, you can see the diaphragm is in this plastic piece with another windscreen on top, but underneath, there are holes there, which means sound can enter and hit the diaphragm from the front and also from the rear, and knowing that sound travels at a specific speed and it will arrive at the front first and then the rear later, it can be calculated to what frequencies you want to um, cancel out, and that is how we get directionality with microphones. Now, the different types of directionality are cardioid, called cardioid because it does look like a heart, picks up very well from the front, some from the sides, and almost none from the rear. The next is hypercardioid, a lot from the front, even less from the sides, um, and then a good amount from the rear, but none from these weird angles on the side. There is also supercardioid, which is a little more narrow and has less of a rear lobe. Um, you have figure eight, which remember a, sorry, not dynamic, a ribbon microphone based on its design and how it works can only ever be a figure eight uh, polar response pattern, which means it picks up from the front and back equally, but nothing from the sides. And the last, which you'll most commonly see with video um, recording cameras is a shotgun microphone. It picks a lot from the center and then very steeply runs off, picks up some from the sides and then some from the rear. Now with each of these polar response patterns, you have distance ratios for them when it comes to picking up sound. So for instance, if I held this omnidirectional microphone at one foot away from a sound source, in order to get that same amount of volume from a shotgun microphone, I can put that shock, shotgun microphone three feet away. And that's because of its directionality and how it picks up sound. It was able to pick up the same volume at a farther distance. So the ratios for those polar response patterns go as follows. Omnidirectional is one to one. So let's say one foot, it'll pick up that specific volume. Cardioid, then goes to 1.7 feet away, hypercardioid, one point, or sorry, two feet away, and shotgun microphone, three feet away to get the same volume picked up. So those are the different polar response patterns and the differences of how they work. So beyond the basic design of microphone, whether dynamic or condenser, or even its polar response pattern, microphones can be designed further for one specific purpose. You can read about these special purpose microphones on page 24 and 25 of the book, or you can also Google search them. One example of a special purpose microphone is an ear set or a headset microphone for vocal speech. There's many different types of special purpose microphones, but it doesn't matter what microphone you're using, it's very important to understand how it's designed and what it's used for. So any microphone you have, go and find the manual for it and read it. You're gonna save yourself a lot of heartache in the future. Uh, one of the most common problems with microphones is uh, ex exceeding the max sound pressure level rating, which means you put the microphone in an environment that's too loud for it. Again, with a ribbon microphone, that could break it. But for other microphones, you're going to run into false harmonics, harmonic distortion, general distortion. Um, you're going to decrease the life of the microphone. For condenser microphones, if you put a too loud of a signal, you're going to loud pops and clicks as it overloads the circuitry. Um, and then for cheaper microphones, know about the self noise and the self noise rating. Uh, if you have to turn a microphone up too loud to get a certain sound, you can have a lot of self noise in there when it comes to a cheaper microphone. So if you get hums and hisses and you're like, what is that coming from? It could be the self noise of a microphone. So look at its self noise rating. Another problem and concern with microphones is the proximity effect. So the proximity effect doesn't happen with omnidirectional microphones, only directional microphones, but remembering the proximity effect and how close you put microphones to sound sources could drastically change your uh, frequency response. So I'm gonna stop here and go to an example of the proximity effect. In this example, I'm gonna be demonstrating the proximity effect. I'm gonna start on this microphone here, the Golden Age Project FC4 MC, I have the cardioid capsule on it, and I'm gonna take off all the effects and play it through Logic. So here you can see the frequency response of the microphone. So I'm just gonna say the ABCs, 
A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. And we can see the base response right here. Curves down pretty low. Now watch what happens as I get closer. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Now I did talk quieter, but you just heard a significant base increase. So the base response is way up here as opposed to down here at the negative 60 decibel range. So there's a significant increase. And that's what happens with the proximity effect. When you get really between an inch or closer to a microphone, um, yeah, you can hear a little increase here, but it's definitely when I get really close. Now I'm going to show it on an omnidirectional microphone, which actually doesn't have the problem of the proximity effect. So this is just an RTA uh, DBX drive rack microphone. Um, and here we go. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Now let's see if I get closer. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. And the frequency response stays really the same throughout. And that's because omnidirectional microphones don't have the problem of the proximity effect because there's no ports in the sides of the microphone. All the sound enters in one side. The proximity effect happens um, by nature of the directionality of a microphone. There's ports on the side that allow sound waves to come at the back end of the diaphragm. And then there's going to be lots of phase cancellation on the higher frequencies and not the lower frequencies. And that's what really causes the proximity effect. And that is the proximity effect. Okay, so hopefully now you have a really good idea of the proximity effect. Some of you may have already experienced this a lot and are very well familiar with it, but for those of you who are not, now you know. The proximity effect is that kind of God voice you get when you're really up close to the microphone. And that's another common problem and concern. Just realizing how close you put the microphone to a sound source is a problem and can um, be a good thing or a bad thing depending on what you're going for. Now, it's also very important to recognize with microphones, not all microphones are created equal. So even the same microphone from one manufacturer um, from one year to another can sound different and act differently, or depending on age, they can act differently. So it's very important to get an idea of how your microphone works, test it, play around with it, listen to it, take recordings, and understand the microphone that you're using so that you can use it for the best scenario. So now I'm going to go to an example of using three condenser microphones, cardioid condenser microphones, and letting you hear the differences between the three. In this example, I'm going to show three different microphones, all cardioid condenser microphones, just to show that not all microphones are created equally. Um, so the same design, you can't just say, well, this one's a cardioid condenser. I can use it for this application. All microphones are different. I'm going to show that here. So I'm starting with this microphone in front of me. I just took off all the effects. You can see um, the frequency response coming in through this uh, two different RTAs, the real-time analyzers, what RTA stands for. And as you can hear, there's a lot of high-end stuff, you know, the kind of reflections from my room. As I get closer, you can hear the bass response get louder, more bass, but it's not boomy. It's not a very warm bass. It's a very flat, accurate uh, frequency response. Now I'm going to move over to the MXL909. It's a large diaphragm condenser microphone. And immediately, you can't hear a lot of the highs of the room. They're, they're gone. Um, and that's because this is a large diaphragm condenser microphone. It's going to take a lot more energy to move that diaphragm than it would the small diaphragm one. Um, and as I get in closer, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, you hear a lot more bass and it's a lot warmer bass sound. So this would be really good for vocal, spoken vocals like this application or radio or something like that. And we're gonna move on to one more. This is a Shure BG 5.1, a vocal microphone for singing. And again, you can't hear too many of the highs, but at the same time, the lows, low, low, lows are also missing as well. This is really just meant for vocal singing in this range here but uh, compared to a dynam dynamic vocal microphone it has a lot more high 
high end with the transients and stuff like that. And so there you have it, three different microphones, all the same design in terms of it's a condenser with a cardioid frequency response or cardioid polar response pattern, um, but very, very different sounds. And these are all relatively cheap microphones. They're not going to break the bank, but it just goes to show you can't just always say, oh, for this application, I'm going to take a cardioid condenser microphone or a cardioid dynamic or a, a figure eight, whatever, and you can always just use it in that situation. It really is dependent on the microphone. So you're going to need to always play around with the equipment that you have. Every instrument is different. Every room is different. So every scenario is going to be different. So really pr play around and try to find the microphone that's best for you. So now we're going to be talking about microphone techniques. And when it comes to microphone techniques, there's all sorts of different kinds of techniques for all sorts of different types of purposes. But the key thing to remember is that there is no formula for anything. You can't say, I'm recording an acoustic guitar, so I always use this microphone, I always point it in this direction, at this fret, from this distance, and it always works well. Because you're not taking into consideration the room around you. You're not taking into consideration the guitar itself, the strings, the pick, the player, the room, whether it's carpeted or not, whether there's reflective surfaces around you, and you're not considering how acoustics work and how the microphone is going to pick that up. So there is no formula. So as I go through all these techniques, I'm only going over them generally so you know what they are, but really you have to take them, practice them, and realize what's happening around you. Think about the world and how the sound is interacting around you, and that can inform your decision on which microphone technique to choose. So when it comes to microphone techniques, there's two main categories. There's distance and close techniques, and they are what they sound like. Close is 12 inches to one inch away, and you're really trying to capture that direct sound and reduce the amount of reverb or room sound or maybe other instruments. The um, best example of close mic techniques that you want to use is on a drum set. You want to put the microphones as close to the source as possible so that when you hit the snare drum, that tom mic is not going to pick up the snare drum every single time. Obviously, drums are loud, so there is going to be some bleed, but you can mitigate that by putting the microphones really close to their sound source. Another um, way you might want to use close miking techniques is using the proximity effect to your benefit. Uh, think of a movie trailer, that deep, low, growly, and now kind of voice, you know? Um, they're probably really close to the microphone getting that bass boost, and they don't want to get the sound of the room in that. They, they want that in-your-face direct sound. And so that's close miking techniques. Now, distance microphone techniques are anywhere from 12 inches and above. And when you do that, you start to incorporate more of the natural sound around you, and you want to have that balance of the direct to reflected sounds. And as soon as you start using distance techniques, there's five considerations. The first is the critical distance, and that's the point at which the reverberations start becoming louder than the direct sound. And so as soon as you hit the critical distance and start going back, things become unintelligible, especially with speech, and they may not be as clear. That might be something you want, it may not, but it's something to consider. Uh, the next is air loss. Remember, there's friction, this is energy, sound does not travel forever. Specifically with high frequencies, they have less energy and they decay quicker. So as soon as you start going farther away, your, less, your high frequencies start to be less clear or bright, and that may be something you want or not. The next is um, phase, and that's specifically when you're using two microphones, just making sure that they're both the exact same distance from the sound source. If not, the sound is going to arrive at different times, and then you're going to have phasing issues. That could be to your benefit or it could not, but again, something to consider. The next is localization. Again, this is only with two microphones, but it could also be with one depending on depth of localization. When you close your eyes and you listen to something, does it sound like it's farther away or closer? So, but really it's one stereo. Is it to the left or right more? Um, but think about localization. Do you want it to the left, to the right, forward, back? That all determines where you place the microphone or microphones. And the last is stereo to mono compatibility. 
Um, not everybody is going to be listening to what you're recording through a stereo speaker or through stereo headsets. So the stereo signal is going to be summed up through mono. And when it sums up, is it going to be horribly comb filtered or have all these phase cancellation issues? And so stereo to mono compatibility is an issue as well. And so those are the two main broad categories of microphone techniques. Now within each of those close and distance, you're going to have um, one, two, or multiple tracks of audio. And that just means you have one, two, or multiple microphones recording at the same time. So close microphone techniques, remember, you're recording drums, but you're recording them with six different microphones that are all close close. Um, microphone techniques. And so that's going to be a multi-track. And you're going to have one instrument that has multiple tracks of audio for that instrument. And so any of these configurations can be worked close distance with mono, stereo, or multi-track. And so uh, from here on forward, we're going to talk about specifically stereo um, techniques. And we're going to start first on page 30 with figure 15. This is the coincident or XY microphone technique, and that is when you place the diaphragms of the microphones over each other so that they are directly aligned, so that there's almost no phasing issues whatsoever. Only the very highest frequencies, which we probably couldn't hear anyways, get canceled out. Alternatively, if you can't overlap them as close as possible, you just put them side by side as close as possible. But really, it's as close as possible to get in almost no phasing issues. Now the XY configuration gives you a compact spatial image and kind of lacks a little bit of depth from front to back. You have a less sense of room, um, but it is a warm uh, kind of picture. Now when you pair them um, with different polar response patterns, it's not going to work with omnidirectional microphones because two omnidirectional microphones on top of each other really only equal one omnidirectional microphone and you will not get the stereo image that you're looking for. So you have to use directional microphones. When you use two bidirectional microphones, you will essentially create an omnidirectional microphone but with a decent stereo image, so you do have localization of left to right, and you will hear a lot of the rest of the room behind you. Now, hypercardioid, you get less of the room behind you, but there's still some, and less of the sides, um, but you get a nice pickup from the front. Two cardioids, you get very good reception from the front and almost no sound from the rear. So that's really good if you're trying to get a stereo image and trying to reject sounds of other things behind you. Now, the next technique is the near coincident technique, and that's when microphones are placed between 1 and 12 inches apart. And they can be pointed inwards or they can be pointed outwards anywhere between 90 and 120 degrees from each other. Um, and again, you do not want to use omnidirectional microphones for these because if they're placed relatively a foot apart, two omnidirectional microphones that close together, it's still just going to sound like one omnidirectional microphone. So these are um, common configurations of near coincident pairs. This is the ORTF configuration with very specific dimensions for it. Cardioid at 170 millimeters apart at anywhere between 0 and 110 degrees. NOS configuration, two cardioids 300 millimeters apart at specifically 0 to 90 degrees apart. Then you have the Faulkner, which is two bi-directional microphones, 200 millimeters apart, and they're both at zero degrees. Now, the near-coincident mic configuration um, provides more depth of room uh, and front and back, has less warmth than the XY, and a larger sense of room than the XY. And remember, phasing is something to consider. As soon as you start going beyond, right on top of each other, Phasing is an issue, so you want to make sure that the microphones are on the exact same plane and the exact same distance from the sound source so that you mitigate phasing as much as possible. Now the next one is the spike, the spaced microphone technique. Now the spaced microphone technique is the only one in which you can use omnidirectional microphones, but there is a formula when you use omnidirectional microphones. The distance from the sound source, we'll call that X, needs to be 3x for the microphones. 
So if this is three feet away from the sound source, then these microphones need to be nine feet apart from each other in order to get a good stereo mix. Because as soon as you start going below that, you're only going to get the sound of one omnidirectional microphone is what it's going to be perceived as. Now, when you're using other directional microphones, again, they're going to be 12 um, inches apart, 12 or more inches apart. Um, they can be spaced, they're going to have to be spaced inward and anywhere again from 0 to 120 degrees and different combinations of different polar response patterns will give you different sounds. Now for the space mic technique, it does have uh, more depth and more sense of room than the other two, but it's gonna st start sounding a little less warm. It's gonna sound more tinny, less of the lows, kind of more of the high sound to it. So we're gonna finish the chapter talking about speakers, and I'm not gonna talk nearly as much on speakers as I did about microphones, and that's for two reasons. The first is, as a volunteer, you're really not going to mess with speakers that much, especially if you're in a space where you have permanently installed speakers. If they're working, great, you don't ever have to touch them. But if you're volunteering in a place uh, like a church that's a mobile church and has to set up every Sunday, you're still going to be messing with them far less because as soon as you have the initial setup, you get the speakers where you want them, you figured out what works well for you, all you have to do is set them up the exact same way every week. Whereas on a band, you might have different members from week to week or guest members or different types of guitars or different instruments. And so microphones are going to have to be switched and uh, swapped and placed in different directions where speakers are always going to be in the same place because you're in the same spot every time. And the second reason I'm going to be talking about speakers much less is because any design that we talked about in microphones can be flipped and applied to a speaker as well as its advantages and disadvantages. And so I'm going to start here with an example showing how a speaker is literally a microphone in reverse and vice versa. In this example, I'm going to demonstrate how a speaker is just a microphone in reverse or you could say a microphone is a speaker in reverse. What I've done is I've taken a speaker from a car and I simply attached an XLR cable to it, plug that into my interface and pumped in the logic. So here in logic, you're gonna be able to see what's going on with the frequency response of the microphone. So here we go. So immediately before I start even talking, you can really see that there's a lot of bass response. And that's due to the self noise of this now microphone, no longer speaker, because uh, I can't keep my hand still. Um, the cable's rattling up against the table. There's going to be a lot of self noise because it's not designed to cancel out that noise. Um, and as you can also hear, there's really no high end frequency response. That's because it's a really huge diaphragm for a microphone. It's going to take so much energy to get those high frequencies. Uh, to really move this diaphragm and it's just never going to happen. So this really is only good for mid to low bass response. And so some people have taken microphones like this that they've made, put it in front of a kick drum, and that's called a sub kick microphone. Uh, Yamaha used to make them. Um, and they're really good at picking up low frequency response, as you can see here. And so, yeah, this is just an example showing that a speaker is a microphone in reverse or a microphone is a speaker in reverse. Uh, because both are transducers. Speakers take electricity and convert it into acoustic sound pressure energy, and then microphones take the acoustic sound pressure energy and convert it to electrical energy. Um, yeah, so here is a speaker microphone. So hopefully now you have a very real and accurate depiction that a speaker is a microphone in reverse and vice versa. So with that, uh, we can apply the different designs. So if you look on page 33 of the book, figure 16, we have a diagram of a speaker. And this is a dynamic speaker. And it works via electromagnetic induction. It works under the same principle and design as a microphone. But it's just designed a little bit differently. So you have a, you have a magnet here. And then you have a coil of wire surrounding the magnet. And when you apply voltage to the wire, that wire is going to move and it's attached to the diaphragm here so the diaphragm is going to move and produce sound so exact same design as a microphone just kind of in reverse 
Now what's different from a microphone is a microphone can be very small and it produces very low voltage when being used. Now speakers have to move a large diaphragm in order to produce loud sounds. So the louder a speaker you want it to be, the larger the diaphragm, the more power you have to put into it in order to get that to move, the more energy that you need. And so to fix that, you have two things. The first is you're going to need a very, very strong magnet. And secondly, you're going to need a high voltage to be applied. And so that's going to lead me to my kind of one and only point that's different from microphones um, when it comes to speakers, and that's amplifiers. Um, I'm not going to go into the different types of amplifiers and how they're used and all these different configurations when it comes to speakers um, because, again, you're really not going to be changing them. Once you have a monitor or a speaker that works and it's already paired up correctly with an amplifier, you set it up the same, same way every time and it just works. Um, but if you do need to buy new speakers, you do need to buy new amplifiers, my one and only thing is just to make sure you pair the right speaker with the right amplifier because we are dealing with electricity. And if you overpower speakers, you're going to move this coil so far that it's going to get stuck and out of alignment of the groove and you'll break the speaker. It'll either move so far that it breaks the spider's um, suspension or it breaks the diaphragm or it comes out of alignment and you just ruin it altogether. Or secondly, if you have mismatches and impedance or wattages or voltages and it's running for a long time, then you can cause a fire. Um, so just make sure that you're using the right amplifier with the right speakers. And as we'll get on to in the next chapter, just making sure you're also using the right cables. Now for the last thing about speakers, uh, I'll talk about is just the advantages and disadvantages, which are very similar when it comes to microphones. Again, uh, with a dynamic microphone, you do not have a linear frequency response and transients are not recepted or received well. The same thing with a dynamic speaker. Uh, transients will not translate well because you have a lot of mass and if an energy source comes very quickly, it's not going to be enough to move that back and forth to get that transient response. So again, smaller speakers, maybe a condenser speaker design will have a better transient response and high frequency response, especially when it's smaller. As well, the um, frequency response of speakers is not all going to be the same, meaning that Different speakers play low frequencies and high frequencies everywhere in between. They're not all going to be playing at the same loudness. Just like microphones do not pick up frequencies at the same loudness, speakers do not play frequencies at the same loudness. And so you can find diagrams on different speakers and their frequency response as well. And then lastly, rather than polar response patterns, speakers just have degrees of projection and you just want to make sure you get the right speaker for your right room and make sure that you have the right degrees of projection so that you have enough coverage in the room so sound is going where you need it to go. Um, lastly, um, most all speakers are directional on some sort but when it comes to subwoofers and how they work and the, how low frequencies interact with the world around us Almost all subwoofers are almost omnidirectional in terms of projection. Uh, but if it's not a subwoofer, it does have some degree of projection. So again, speakers are really just microphones in reverse. Read your manuals, understand how they work, know what you're working with, and that's basically it when it comes to speakers. And so that's been chapter two, transducers of the basics of audio technology training series. If you have any questions, feel free to comment below. Uh, I will also post my email in the description. You can email me with any questions. Please like and subscribe to the channel and please share this video with anybody. Again, I want this to be accessible for anybody to learn. Thanks and have a good day.